Welcome to Classic Paranormal, where we bring you true stories of the weird, strange, and otherworldly from works of literature from the past that time forgot. Don't forget to hit the share button to help promote this podcast. In this seventh episode of the series, you will be entertained by Hamlin Garland's 40 Years of Psychic Research, first published in 1936. Chapter 19, Impersonation Without Trance. In the years following the World War, I continued my occasional addresses on psychical subjects, always on the lookout for sensitives willing to share with me their experience. I was willing to leave their beliefs undisturbed if they would assist me in further analysis of the method. Several of those with whom I experimented were publishing books whose composition, so they said, was the work of personalities outside themselves and higher than themselves. Naturally, they could not permit a searching analysis of the sources of their inspiration. Others were preachers, leaders of congregations, and very naturally opposed to scientific research. Scores of books and manuscripts composed under spirit control came to me for approval, not for judgment. Not one of them expected me to say, as I was forced to do, that such writing was, in my opinion, merely the product of their own subconscious minds. Granting the marvel of the process, I replied in several such cases, the product has small literary or philosophic value. These manuscripts are all deeply religious in tone and biblical in phraseology. One of the most curious, I might also say monumental, books of this sort is the romance Patience Worth, written under inspiration by a Kansas woman who was aided, so she declared, by the spirit of an English girl of the 16th century. Patience Worth, this invisible author, not only wrote her own story, but ventured upon a voluminous, sorry tale of the time of Christ. Relying on this guide, Mrs. Coran came at last to a stage of mediumship in which she was able to extemporize poems without a moment's hesitation upon any subject named by a visitor. This she did without going into trance. I have in my files the record of my first sitting with Mrs. Coran. During our talk, she told me that her literary career began with the Ouija board, but that she had gradually grown free from it. I still keep it under my hand, she said, but I no longer spell out the messages from patients. I am able to speak them. Placing me in a chair opposite her, she held one side of the lettered board whilst I held the other. Her husband, a St. Louis newspaperman, I believe, sat beside her with a pencil poised over a notebook ready to make a record of the test. Thereupon, with no hint of abnormal psychology, Mrs. Coran composed and spoke, without hesitation or blunder, a poem on a cup of tea, a subject named by the hostess. I observed that when Mrs. Coran outran her husband's pencil, and he called wait, she stopped, even in the middle of a line, and later took it up again, precisely as if she were repeating something from memory. She did this when the subject was suggested by me. I observed, however, that Patience used words which belonged to Kansas and not to the England of 1600, and that she was inclined to be impudent in her replies. In other later tests, I heard Mrs. Coran dictate many similar poems while standing before a throng of guests, and I had opportunity afterward to read typed stenographic records of these improvisations. My estimate of their literary value was not high. The poems were clever, astonishingly so, but they ran to fixed phrases and in accordance with a formula. They were all below, some of them considerably below publishing level. They were graceful, thoughtful, and quaint, but failed to win the approval of austere literary critics. Most automatic writing is gravely philosophical in subject and sets forth a highly moral interpretation of the universe. All religious and scientific problems are solved by these invisible sages. Sometimes the inspiring spirit is an ancient, sometimes a famous modern philosopher. But in all cases, the mediums are confident of their value as teachers. I do not pass final judgment on these books. I merely say that they do not interest me. Two of the most distinguished authors of my acquaintance make use of subconscious inspiration. In fact, I myself once depended upon it, but I controlled and directed it. I still joke about old subconscious mind with my daughters. It is a faithful servant, but I keep close watch upon it. I accepted suggestions, but I ruthlessly revise and correct them. I have many times induced automatic writing in my friends. Sometimes it is backhanded and upside down and can only be read in a mirror. This is what is called mirror writing. In my first experiment with my friend Mrs. Judah, her hand wrote in mirror script these words. My name is John Smith. I was drowned in the lake on August 10th, 1888. This so startled Mrs. Judah that she sprang up from her chair and fled. I could never get her to sit again. In two other cases of these impromptu after-dinner experiments, I have apparently caused trance and automatic writing with curious impersonations. In one case, the spirit impersonated seemed to be that of a famous murderess who had recently been hanged. And while the lovely psychic was pleading, I didn't do it. I saw it done, but I didn't kill him. She held her hands behind her back as if manacled, and her face became hideously contorted as though she were being strangled by a rope. All this could be simulated, of course. 
but some of her communications were true, so the members of the circle asserted. These trances appeared genuine, but I regarded them as entertainment for the guests who had requested them. I mention them here as leading up to communications without trance. One day in New York City, an old friend, Edwin Winter, invited me to lunch with him at the Banker's Club, and when I entered the grand reception room 30 stories above Wall Street, he met me with another guest whom he presented as Mr. Trainer. Trainer, he said, has had the gift of second sight ever since he was a child, and I think will interest you. The clairvoyant was so normal in appearance and so candid of expression that I could not relate him to any distinctive phase of mediumship. And during our luncheon, surrounded as we were by hundreds of hilarious businessmen, no observer would have distinguished our table as one given over to spooks. Nevertheless, our talk was of the occult. Trainer told us that he had all his life been able to see forms invisible to others and to report their words to his friends and relatives. Winter interrupted to say, he often does this at my home without going into a trance and without laying down his cigar. What seems to be the process? I asked of Trainer. It seems to be a negative process, he thoughtfully replied. I have only to throw my eyes out of focus and render my mind as blank as possible. In this negative state, I wait till a figure, a portrait, or a message comes into my mind. Then I report what I see or hear. I have no power to distinguish the false from the true. I am like a wireless receiving station. I get messages and give them for what they are worth to my listeners. Winter said, the truth of his messages is astounding. I was a railway president for many years and Trainer gets hold in some way of my old cronies in the northwest and they talk to me through him for hours while we are seated beside my fire. I can't account for this, but it is a fact. You and Mrs. Garland must come to dinner soon. I'll have Trainer in and we'll see what happens. Trainer interested me. He was intelligent and candid, not irritated nor alarmed by my skeptical attitude and most reasonable in his claims. I'm willing to try anything, he said. Winter, a widower and a man of 70, lived in one of the huge apartment houses on Park Avenue. And when my wife and I entered his reception room a few days later, we did not in the least suggest the members of a spiritistic circle. The apartment was a long way from the Boston back parlors in which I'd begun my investigation some 30 years before. It was a handsome room, and trainer and dinner dress looked less like a medium than at our luncheon in the banker's club. Augustus Thomas came in later, and I was especially glad of his presence, for he had made a special study of mind reading and clairvoyance. It is in these directions the trainer's power moves, Winter explained. Nothing was said of his mediumship during dinner, but an hour later, as we were all sitting before the fire with our coffee and cigars, Winter turned to trainer and said, Well, Tom, do you see any spooks in the room? Trainer holding his cigar in his finger slowly replied, Yes, I see a young woman standing beside Mrs. Garland. This startled my wife, for she not only disbelieved such phenomena, but heartily disliked all discussion of them. She did nothing to encourage Trainer, and neither did I. We both waited in silence. Without going into trance, but with glance out of focus, Trainer went on. She says her name is Scales. Carrie L. Scales. She's about 35. She's tall, with brown hair combed up in a roll above her brow. She says to you, Mrs. Garland, that you were not with her when she passed out. Neither was her husband. This name and this description amazed my wife, so exactly true were they. But she remained silent. As he went on, he began to impersonate the dead woman. He spoke as if she were using his organs of speech. Addressing my wife directly, Carrie entered into the most intimate personal details. For a time, I resented my husband's second marriage. But I am resigned to it now, she said. She described events of which my wife had no knowledge and of which Trainer could not have read, and my wife was deeply moved by them. He could not have known of these family conditions, she declared, but every relationship and every description was exactly true. Turning abruptly to our host, Trainer said, There is a man here who says he has known you ever since you were a boy. He says, I used to see you on the platform of the station of Beloit, Wisconsin. You used to come down to the train with pails of berries to sell to the passengers. That's right, said Winter, so I did. Trainer now impersonated this man. You remember me, he said to Winter. I was a conductor on the local which ran from Chicago to Madison. I wore a fancy vest, you'll remember that vest. And it was my habit to wait till the last car came along before swinging on. You liked to see me do it, you admired me. Here he changed his tone. After you became a big man in the railway business, you made me a division superintendent. That was a mistake. I wasn't big enough for the job. Amused and excited, Winter turned to me. I recall that man perfectly, but I haven't thought of him for years. All that he says is true. I did sell berries on the station platform, and I did watch him swing onto the rear car platform. I recall his fancy vest. It is true also that after I became general manager of the Northern Railway, I promoted him. 
He proved a failure as superintendent and I put him back on as conductor on a train. It is impossible for Trainer to know these details except by some occult process. For those details about the berries, the fancy vest, and my admiration for the man are not on record anywhere. They exist only in my own mind. In fact, I'd entirely forgotten them. He then told us that Jim Hill and many others of his old railway companions often came to him through Trainer. They talked to me by the hour. As a spook, Hill is just as loquacious as he was in my office in St. Paul. Turning to Thomas, Trainer now began to talk of an old-time actor with whom Augustus had once been intimately associated, bringing to light certain facts of which Augustus himself had no knowledge. I'll have to look into the records, he said. My case is not so clear as yours, Winter, for this spirit friend of mine was an actor well known on Broadway for 20 years. Nevertheless, Trainer had made some very startling statements. At their lowest terms, they were clairvoyant. I didn't know that this actor's real name was Dempsey, and I didn't know that my employer, Washington Bishop, the mind reader, had a brother. This is a brief outline of an astonishing performance, for Trainer brought up several other personalities. In fact, all his messages bore on the question of identity. Seated in the light of the fire and smoking a cigar, he suggested nothing of the medium in his action or speech, and yet he had some unexplained power. It appeared that he could turn this power off and on like twisting a key. He stopped as abruptly as he began. They are all gone, he said. Winter then said to me, I like Trainer's attitude toward this thing. You can deal with him as frankly as you please. I frequently interrupt and go over my cases with him. Trainer confirmed this by saying, I don't know how I do these things. Some say I get my facts out of newspapers and encyclopedias. If I did, I would have no time for anything else. I don't quite see how you could get the facts of my wife's sister-in-law for they are not in any biography or encyclopedia. Where did he get that conductor's fancy vest and my pails of berries, demanded Winter. It is clearly a case of mind reading, said Thomas. I traveled with Washington Irving Bishop for two years, and so far as I can now recall, I never met his brother or heard him speak of his brother, and yet I might have had that fact registered somewhere deep in my subconscious memory. It is rather significant, I hear remark, that Trainer had almost nothing for me, although I am the one man whose family history is detailed in his son to the middle border and other volumes of reminiscences. This has been my experience all along. No psychic has brought me details of my dead relatives such as Trainer had given to you and Mrs. Garland. Where did you find the name Cariel Scales? I don't know, he frankly replied. It came into my mind with the form. I've seen these forms which are invisible to others ever since I was a child. My father used to punish me for lying, as he called it. This mediumistic faculty had been a serious handicap to me in business. Bankers don't like to deal with mediums, and so I keep still about this power when in my office. As we were going away, Winter placed in my hand a packet of papers and said, Read these at your leisure and let me know what you think of the case they present. This I did the following day, and the story which these records presented is so strong a brief for personal survival that I think it should be given here in some detail, although I heard only part of the spirit confession. I read the letters carefully, but I did not copy them, and I am now dependent upon my memory, although the leading facts are recorded in my diary. Winter presented in substance this revelation. One night, Trainer, while spending the evening with me, abruptly said, There is a man here, a queer seedy old chap who says that he is a kind of uncle of yours. A kind of uncle, I said? What does he mean by that? He says you never saw him, but he married your Aunt Sarah when you were a child. He says his name is Milton K. Smalley. I thought a moment. I faintly remembered that there was such a marriage, but the man was only a name. I never saw him. The marriage was not often alluded to. I had forgotten him completely. What does he want? He doesn't seem to want anything, just wishes to say he didn't appreciate your aunt. He would like to identify himself and clear his record. He says, I left your aunt and went down to Lowell just before the Civil War broke out. I enlisted in one of the first Massachusetts regiments to go south and I was killed in the Baltimore ride along with four other men. That can be easily verified, I said. The records on file at the State House in Boston will show your name and the date of your death. In the bundle of papers which he had given me was a letter to the Adjutant General in Boston. In his reply, the Adjutant General said, There is no such name on the rolls of that regiment, and no such man was killed as the regiment was marching through Baltimore. Winter's report went on. The next time Trainer came, I told him what the Adjutant had written. He then became silent and that fixed look came into his eyes. When he spoke, he impersonated Smalley. Of course you didn't find me under that name. I enlisted under another name altogether. You see, I'd been living with another woman since leaving your aunt, and I enlisted as Jackson Turner. This was as far as Winter's records carried me. 
but a few weeks later, while my wife and I were again dining with him, Winter took a letter from his pocket and handed it to me. Here is the concluding document in that curious case of Smalley's. The letter was from the adjutant and confirmed Smalley's story in every detail. A man named Jackson Turner had enlisted in that regiment and had been killed in the streets of Baltimore along with three other men. Winter then said, I wrote my sister and here is a letter confirming the story of Sarah's marriage, so that Smalley was, as he says, a kind of uncle of mine. Now what are we to do about that? How could Trainer know what I did not know, what the war office didn't know, and what none of my family knew? I couldn't answer these questions then, and I cannot answer them now. I am willing to grant that these facts strengthen the case for personal survival, although I must add the trainer was never able to give me any similar proof. Not long after these evenings at Winter's home, I arranged to have trainer lunch with me and meet an old friend who had lately lost his wife and was eager to see if she could speak to him. My friend, whom I shall call Brown, was living in a hotel near Times Square, and our luncheon was served in his own private suite. We were hardly finished eating, and the waiter was busily clearing away the dishes when our host turned to trainer and said, Have you anything for us? Conditions could scarcely have been more unfavorable to any mediumistic action. We had all eaten heartily, two men were smoking, and I was sipping my coffee, but almost immediately Trainer began to impersonate Jane Brown, the dead wife. From his lips came words which indicated that the dying woman had twice left the body and that she had visited friends during her first flight. I heard your voice, she said, and returned to my body. I heard you, but I could not answer. Trainer turned to me and spoke in Jane's character. I wanted to see you before you went home, but I was not able to do so. I was too weak. This was the fact. I'd been staying with Brown to help him bear the anxiety of his wife's illness, but was at last obliged to fill some lecture dates. The apparent death of Mrs. Brown and her revival a few hours later was true, and so was her reported appearance at the bedside of a friend, as I afterward learned. Brown, though much moved by the singular drama, continued to smoke while it was going on, and so did Trainer. It remains the most unconventional of all my sittings and in some ways the most impressive. At a later sitting, one very illogical communication came to me. Trainer said, there is a southern man here who says his name is Kingman. He says, you knew my son. He's been a failure from my point of view. Did you mean Edward Kingman? Yes, he's my son. You know him well. Yes, he was my agent at one time. Why? What can I do for him or for you? Nothing really came out of this talk except a wonder on my part that Kingman should come to me. I never knew him, but I dimly recalled that he manufactured pianos somewhere in the West. I was equally puzzled when Mr. John G. Shedd, the former partner of Marshall Field, complained to me that Chicago was not managing his public aquarium properly. I did not know Shedd, and I knew nothing of the management of his aquarium. There was no logic in his addressing me. In all these experiments with Trainer, the question of identity was uppermost. The method of communication was subordinated and proof was difficult. All the messages were open to the mind-reading charge. Somebody knew these facts and faces and Trainer appeared to be able to seize upon them, no matter how deep laid a sitter's unconscious thought might be. This phase of public mediumship practiced on hundreds of platforms throughout the country is sought by many thousands of eager auditors. Messages are given by the lecturer at the close of his address in swift alternation from left to right of his audience. He appears to select each recipient by some inner suggestion and hits the mark each time, if one may judge from the applause. I have listened to many such exhibitions, but always with a feeling of doubt, for the messages are so swift and so consolingly stereotyped that they fail of convincing me. My experiences in private investigation have been tedious and painful, floundering and confused. All those who came before my committee were manifestly fishing for names. At a public meeting of the Branch Society in Los Angeles, however, an Englishwoman gave an exhibition of this sort which had elements of proof in it. First of all, she was a complete stranger to her audience, and had been in the city but a day or two. She had hardly been out of her room, and she was surrounded by the officers of the society, including the honorary chairman, myself. Despite these facts, she gave a most convincing demonstration of mind reading, or some other occult perception. Among other test messages, she addressed a tall, blonde young girl entirely Nordic in appearance and said, There is a Spanish woman standing beside you, an elderly woman in Spanish dress with a mantilla over her head. Her name is Carmelita. She says she is your grandmother. As she gave the message, the girl appeared moved by its truth. She acknowledged that she had a Spanish grandmother and that her name was Carmelita. As this psychic went on describing other invisibles and giving their names and messages, she quite convinced me that, like Trainer, she had a perceptive sense which is denied the ordinary individual. It was restricted in range, and the messages were of the usual consolation type. 
but given here in the blaze of electric lights to an audience of several hundred people, they were of greater value than when given under trance or in the dark. As chairman of our research committee, I arranged several sittings for Trainer in the rooms of the New York Society, and without the slightest pretension to trance, he showed a perceptive power quite similar to that of the Englishwoman of whom I have just spoken. With the stenographic reports of these sittings before me, I am able to quote the valuable testimony of a distinguished lawyer, who declared that some of the men in lawsuits which Trainer described while impersonating Judge Blank, an old California friend, dated back 20 years or more, and had been completely forgotten by him. It was quite impossible the trainer could have known of them in any normal way. On its lowest terms, this performance was a reading of the lawyer's subconscious mind. Trainer was unsuccessful in his attempt to read a sealed letter, but he succeeded in giving something of the history of two finger rings which were placed in his hand. I particularly liked his straightaway method. He did not flounder or fish for clues. He said again, I give you what comes into my mind. It may be true or it may not. I am only a wireless receiving station. I have no such way of determining the truth or falsity of the communication. That is up to you. Platform psychomancy is an important problem for the reason that all over America such performances are being given every Sunday, and thousands of people attend these meetings. That they get something which comforts them is evident, for they go again and again. Doubters accuse such mediums of digging into graveyards and thumbing county histories, but not all of the messages are capable of being thus explained. Some of the persons thus publicly recalled to life never rose to the dignity of being named in any biography nor of being listed in the telephone book. Fortunately, we were able to quote Dr. Alexis Carroll on this phase of mediumship. In a book just published, he concedes the truth of clairvoyance, telepathy, and several other phases of the claims of psychic researchers. Chapter 20. Phantasmal Fingerprints No one knows what the processes of mediumship precisely are. Granted that physical phenomena exist, the questions how are they produced and what are the physical and mental strains upon the medium remain unanswered. Some observers consider mediumship a temporary dissociation of personality, a destructive splitting up of the psychological unity which forms an individual. Others contend that it is a species of possession, a period of weakness which allows an alien mind, often a malevolent mind, to dominate the individual. Insanity is considered by some to be such a possession. In their opinion, the practice of mediumship is a surrender of the will, a dangerous practice not to be encouraged. Most spiritualists, however, regard the trance as a negative state during which certain invisible entities are permitted to use the body of the sleeper in their various manifestations. Others more scientific consider the trance a condition of conscious rest in which the subconscious self is free to manifest in many forms outside the body. The something material actually goes out of the psychic, whether in trance or not, is made evident by instruments which register the loss of heat, of weight, and of physical power. In its deepest phase, it is a kind of death. So far as my own experience goes, the reality of the trance has not been proven. I have never been able to convince myself of its genuineness. There is no easy way of determining whether the psychic is actually in trance or only pretending to be, for it is known that certain individuals are proof against needles and hot irons. Doctors writing on hysteria assert that they have had patients who were insensible to hot pokers and the fumes of ammonia. Hypnotists in public exhibitions give evidence of such insensibility. A young man who came before my committee was able to thrust hat pins through his cheek without wincing or drawing blood. Furthermore, I have observed that all those trance mediums with whom I have experimented have betrayed on awakening a very definite knowledge of what had gone on during their supposed unconsciousness. It may be argued that this knowledge was obtained through subconscious channels, but I still remain doubtful of the trance. I have always discounted it when estimating the value of an experiment. No psychic is willing to have the veil of mystery stripped from his processes. He naturally refuses to admit shamming. He adds to the mystery rather than takes from it. Some of the most powerful psychics with whom I experimented did not enter into trance. They were as wide awake as I. Even Mrs. Smiley, who apparently went into deep sleep, groaning and gasping, was at other times awake and perfectly normal while the most inexplicable phenomena were going on, upsetting all my theories. Several times while thus calmly joining in the talk of the circle, she assured me that she remembered nothing of the fuss she had been making. Her sufferings could not have been serious, for she continued the practice for forty years. To further illustrate this point, I have just read the report of a seance in a South American city in which an academic committee states that after a series of most astounding materializations, the medium, a scholarly man of middle age, suddenly collapsed, convulsed, and nauseated. And yet, the writer adds, he recovered in a few minutes and showed no sign of his terrifying seizure. 
Aosapia Palladino, after nearly 30 years of unequaled strain, not to call it torture, showed little signs of it in face or figure. And so far as reported, all the famous psychics studied by Roche, Schrank, Nozick, and Jelly, while frequently convulsed during experiments, suffered little lasting injury. Apparently, the practice of mediumship, whether in trance or out, does not necessarily shorten the life of the practitioner. Nevertheless, all the mediums I have known agree in saying something goes out of me, and they all at the close of a sitting showed weariness and a distinct numbness, a condition which persisted for several hours afterward. Daniel Peters said, On the day following a sitting, I am not much good at the office. It is nothing serious. I'm just tired as if I had been up after midnight playing chess. It thus appears that the various phases of mediumship differ in their effects on the mind and body of the practitioner. In my experience, it was evident that clairvoyance, clairaudience, slate writing, and even the direct voice did not make the demand upon the body and brain which the use of the trumpet and the production of ectoplasm forms undoubtedly do. They all admit, however, that they must allow time between sittings for recuperation. A slate writer, on the contrary, can sit for phenomena several times each day without injury, and trumpet mediums can enter a circle several times a week. All this points to the biodynamic character of the process. The practitioner is something more than a sensitive, a passive instrument. She is an engine whose occult powers are more or less under control of her will. Just how much or how little she directs them is our problem. Some mediums following in the footsteps of Hume and Fay boast of their ability to perform difficult feats at will. Peters, when about to produce a certain result, said, I will do so and so. Botazzi taught Palladino's hands to do his will. In some cases, I myself have wrought the psychic out of her method into mine. In most instances, however, individuals who possess these powers treat their seances as rituals whose order set by a higher intelligence cannot be changed. Of unquestioning faith themselves, they have no patience with conscientious inquirers. Their sittings remain inconclusive and repetitious. Insisting on darkness, they refuse to have their limbs controlled and the scientific investigator remains a mere listener. In most seances, he is not even an onlooker. Such programs are worthless to an investigator of the process. For these reasons, the spiritualistic performances of today are almost identical with those of 60 years ago. Several meetings that I have recently attended presented the same credulous odd circle, the same ringing of bells by invisible hands, the same voices declaring themselves to be the Mother or John or Big Thunder. And all this traditional business continues while Jelly, Morselli, and other Europeans of precise knowledge are seeking to prove the supernormal processes of mediumship by bringing to bear mechanical and electric control. With intent to prove the identity of these spirit hands, prints of them have been obtained in flour and on sheets of paper. And Dr. Jelly, in 1919, obtained plaster cast of these supernumerary limbs by requesting the invisibles to dip their hands into melted paraffin. Gloves of wax were thus formed, and when plaster of Paris was poured into these molds, exact models of the spirit hands resulted. Expert witnesses, sculptors, stated that the wrists of these gloves were so small that the hands on which they were formed could not have been normally withdrawn, and that the ectoplasmic hand must have dematerialized. Artists and medical men united in declaring that these molds exhibited joint and skin peculiarities which in no particular related to the joints and skin markings of the psychic, who was thus cleared of all complicity in their making. The hands belonged to some other person than the medium. Dr. Gustav Jelly, director of the International Metaphysic Institute, in his latest volume, published in 1919, details these experiments and definitely says, quote, I saw the spectral hands in the process of making these wax molds, end quote. He also declares that he saw the ectoplasmic lips from which the direct voice came and that they were not those of the psychic. He makes the very curious observation that the words from these lips appeared to be formed on an inhaled and not an exhaled breath. This was a new thought to me, and after reading his statement I experimented and came to the conclusion that he was correct. It may be that it is this use of the indrawn breath which so often gives to the spirit voice its indistinct and personal quality. Dr. Jelly makes another important statement. He says, the materialization of animals is no longer in doubt. He asserts that in the presence of Sir Oliver Lodge, in a locked room with all the sitters chained, he felt a hairy animal moving about. Lodge also touched this creature and called it an ape. But the spirit of his son Raymond, who was present, said, It is not an ape, but a primitive man. Jelly adds, dog forms also came into the circle, and a spectral bird was photographed while seated on the shoulders of the medium. Here again, the medium must be cleared of all deception. No sleight of hand, no trick can produce a spectral bird or an ape man in a circle of physicists in a locked room, with all observers chained together. I quite agree with Shelley when he says, quote, 
In my opinion, metaphysic science involves inferences which will revolutionize biology and psychology. It is not a question of religion or philosophy, but of fact, end quote. But I do not find in these materialized animal forms proof of the spirit hypothesis. Nothing like these European proofs of identity was carried on in America till 1924, when a group of Boston investigators set out to repeat Shelley's experiments with paraffin gloves and plaster of Paris molds. The medium in this case was Marjorie Crandon, the young wife of Dr. L.G.R. Crandon, a well-known surgeon connected with one of the principal hospitals of the city. I first learned of these experiments through the usual newspaper expose of the medium, and from time to time I read articles attacking or defending the Crandons. But I knew little of the actual facts concerning them till in 1927 I accepted membership on the board of directors of the American Society for Psychical Research. At the very first meeting which I attended, the Marjorie Mediumship, as it was called, came up for discussion, and I learned that two of the directors were bitterly opposed to the Crandons, and that a resolution instructing the editor of the Society's journal to print no more articles or letters concerning the Lime Street sittings was being formulated. One or two members asserted that a recent report by an academic committee had exposed the medium, but others who had taken part in several experiments at Dr. Crandon's house were not so ready to vote for the resolution. We should keep an open mind and publish arguments for as well as against the Lime Street findings, they said. In speaking in support of this position, I said, I have no direct knowledge of Mrs. Crandon's mediumship, but after 30 years of personal experimentation, I do not assume to pass judgment on her performance without seeing it. Prejudiced reports by a newspaper man have no decisive value with me. Scientific investigators in Europe have worked patiently for many years upon problems which these critics claim to have solved in one or two hours of observation. We should approach every new seance as a chemist approaches an experiment with new chemicals. Every circle is a different combination of creative elements. The problem is human, as well as psychical. We should share many sittings with the Crandons before passing judgment upon them. In such wise, the scientists of France and Italy have proceeded. Gelli and Rocher gave many years to the study of mediumship. As I understand it, we are neither a spiritualistic society nor an organization to expose mediums. Our task is to patiently investigate and report fairly on what we see. I am eager to witness the novel phenomena which credible witnesses declare Crandon and his wife have developed. I welcome news from them. It was at this meeting, perhaps as a result of my talk, that Mr. Bristol, the president, asked me to become the chairman of his research committee. Select your associates, he said, and make such tests of the Crandons and their phenomena as you see fit. Riding home in the car of John R. Gordon, vice president of the society, I learned more in detail of the Crandons. The two most valuable of their contributions to the record of psychic research, he said, are these. Taking a leaf out of police records, they have secured prints on wax of a man's thumb, prints differing from those of any thumb in the circle. This clears Mrs. Crandon from the charge of fraud and the use of her hands. Their next advance was along the line of proving that she had no normal connection with the spirit voice. They have devised a machine to that end. I hope you'll go to Boston and take these important claims into immediate consideration. This use of thumbprints as a test of identity interested me. That is a very real contribution to the science, I said, and I shall at once get in touch with the Crandons. The facts concerning the Crandons as I now assembled them were these. Beginning in 1924, a group of amateur investigators who had been meeting at Dr. Crandon's home in Boston with intent to develop the mediumship of his wife Marjorie attempted to secure paraffin molds of the ectoplasm hands of Walter, their guide. Following the methods which Dr. Jelly had used in Paris, they requested Walter to immerse his ectoplasmic hand in a pot of warm wax and to let it cool in the air. In this way, they obtained gloves into which plaster was poured and the exact features of the invisible hand reproduced. Several such gloves were secured by the Crandon Circle. The hands were all masculine, their historian reported, and none of them showed any of the characteristics of Dr. Crandon's hands. Some of these molds were of the doubled fist. Out of this series of experiments came a still more original suggestion. Why not obtain thumbprints of the manifesting spirit? No one of us had any definite belief that fingerprint patterns of a dead man's hand could be reproduced through the power of a medium. But Dr. Crandon had faith in Walter, the control, who claimed to be the dead brother of the psychic. He promised to lend his best efforts to such an experiment. To him was referred the problem. How can we best secure and record the pattern of your thumb? At Walter's suggestion, various media were tried. Ink, paraffin smeared on glass, and other methods were employed, but none of them was satisfactory. At last, one of the group, a dentist, suggested the use of wax, the material used in taking impressions with teeth. This substance, known as cur, was adopted as the best medium for taking and retaining impressions, and for nearly two years, experiments of this sort were tried with complete success. 
Thumbprints had been obtained which were neither those of the psychic nor those of Dr. Crandon. Meanwhile, Walter's voice had become amazingly lifelike, and his speech fluent and characteristic reported one of my associates. He told Dr. Crandon where to find some of his own fingerprints. They were on a razor I used, he said. These prints were found but proved so fragmentary that they were inconclusive. Walter has been dead some 15 years, but he is cooperating in all these experiments with cheerful readiness and notable skill. So much I learned from Gordon and other of my fellow members on the board of directors. And I said to Mr. Bristol, I am convinced that Mrs. Crandon is the most interesting psychic in America, and as chairman of your research committee I shall write to Dr. Crandon requesting the privilege of testing for myself some of his wife's marvelous phenomena. Bristol and Gordon agreed that I should go to Boston and arrange if possible a series of sittings for my committee. This was in February of 1927, but it was not till May that I wrote to Dr. Crandon asking the privilege of sitting in at one of his seances. He replied, I shall be delighted to have you join our circle. Come to dinner. We should be especially pleased to have you as our guest for the night. From certain of my Boston friends, I learned that Crandon was well connected in the city. One friend wrote, He is a charming host and entertains many distinguished guests. His wife, the medium, is young, vivacious, and pretty. On the strength of this letter, I accepted Crandon's invitation to dinner and clothed myself accordingly. Although in my youth I lived ten years in Boston, I had never set foot in Lime Street and had no notion of its location. But the driver of my cab took off across the common, turned to the left just where the back bay meets Beacon Street, and a few minutes later drew up before a substantial three-story brick house on a clean and quiet street. It was with something more than ordinary curiosity that I approached the door of number ten. If one quarter of the marvels reported from here are true... This is the most important psychical laboratory in America. The maid who received me led me up a flight of stairs into a handsome library where Dr. Crandon, an attractive man just under middle age, received me. I was most favorably impressed by him. He was scholarly in appearance, slender, low-voiced, and graceful, entirely in keeping with his book walled study. He was in dinner dress, and so were the two men whom he introduced me to as Dr. Richardson and Mr. Butler. Neither of these men could be called eccentric in speech or dress. I saw nothing in any of them to warrant the bitter attacks which had been made upon them. A few minutes later, our hostess, the widely celebrated Marjorie, came in, a lovely young woman charmingly gowned. She was much younger than I had expected her to be. She was indeed hardly more than a girl. In the belief that my readers will be interested in the human side of this problem, I frankly confess that I was surprised as well as pleased by the tasteful dining room to which the hostess led the way. The guests who took their seats about her ample table were equally surprising. They impressed me as a group of cultivated people who were seriously pursuing an investigation of occult forces, while remaining quite normal in their social relationships. I saw nothing in them resembling the cranks, dupes, and tricksters which newspaper men had reported them to be. Mrs. Crandon had given me a seat beside her, and as soon as courtesy permitted, I said, I hope you won't mind my asking a great many questions. I hate to be a bore, but I am eager to know more about you. I must improve my opportunities. Proceed, she said. I'll answer as best I can. She showed no signs of the many grueling tests to which she had been subjected for nearly four years. She was not only smilingly at ease but humorous in her replies, and yet beneath her gay mood I caught now and then a hint of serious purpose. I am willing to undergo any test you care to make, she said toward the close of the dinner. I take a special interest in having you study my case, for I know you and your books. She did not argue for the spirit hypothesis, but she spoke of her brother as if he were alive. Walter is a good deal of a tyrant. He insists that our sitting shall begin at exactly nine. At a quarter to nine, she rose, and following her husband's lead, we mounted to the third story of the house, where one by one we entered a small chamber in which a faint electric globe was burning. The room was so dark that I could see only a few strange machines and a tall cabinet of glass which stood against the wall. Dr. Richardson, a member of the group who had charge of the psychic, called my attention to this three-sided cabinet and explained its use. These two small apertures cut through the solid glass sides are so placed that Marjorie's hands can be thrust through them and wired or padlocked on the outside. He then showed me an instrument composed of a long glass tube bent to form two upright vessels, filled with water on which rested two balls of pith. To one of these tubes a rubber hose several feet in length was attached. Presenting this small tube for my inspection, he said, This is the voice cutout machine invented by one of our group. It renders the psychic absolutely speechless while Walter's voice is heard. Place this glass mouthpiece between your lips. You will find that it fills your mouth to the corner so completely that you cannot utter a sound. With this flat mouthpiece between my lips, I tried to speak but could only utter a low moan through my nose. Dr. Richardson went on. As you will see, this mouthpiece is attached to a rubber tube which connects with these two glass tubes. 
As long as you blow, the two pith balls floating on the liquid within these tubes are out of equilibrium. If you fail to keep up the pressure, they approach each other's level. Now, blow. I blew, and the two balls moved to an unbalanced position. I ceased to blow, and they fell to a common level. I could see no way in which the machine could fail to act as a cutout of the medium's voice. Dr. Richardson then said, At first we used a round glass tube as the mouthpiece, but we found that an experimenter could make sounds from the corners of his mouth. We then designed this flat mouthpiece. In spite of it, however, Walter, our invisible, while the psychic is blowing into the tubes, always whistles, which is, of course, especially difficult. In fact, it is impossible, as you will find, so long as this glass instrument fills your mouth. Meanwhile, Mrs. Crandon had cheerfully taken her place in the glass cabinet, and my attention was called to her hands, which had been locked outside the cabinet. The light was then lowered, and almost immediately Walter manifested himself by voice and movement. The room became his veritable workshop. Dr. Crandon, Richardson, and Butler moved about at his suggestion like attendants in a physical laboratory. The proceedings were in no sense religious. The spirit of the circle was wholly scientific. No hymns were sung, and no invocations voiced. At an early stage of the program, they put into my hands a box with a series of partitions so arranged that an electric bell installed therein could not be reached by any outside agent. The bell rang when I took it up, and at Dr. Richardson's suggestion, I turned completely round while holding it, thus proving that no wire connection existed. It might have been rung by some wireless arrangement, but not otherwise. They then showed me a pair of scales which balanced even when weights were piled on one pan while the other remained empty. Certainly, the psychic had no hand in this. Now came the test of the cutout machine. With the mouthpiece of the tube placed between the psychic's lips while I stood near enough to witness it, she was told to blow. As she did so, holding the pith balls at unequal heights, Walter's voice rang out in a jocular remark. Her complicity in the production of that voice seemed disproved. She had no normal part in it. Of its supernormal production, she may be considered the cause, for it took place only in her presence. In a group of this kind, I failed of the close grapple with the phenomenon which my committee desired but I was given opportunity for testing this and that instrument, and the light was fairly strong. I could not forget, however, that this was a circle of the psychic's friends meeting in a prepared seance room, and at the close of the sitting, while Dr. Crandon and I were alone in his library, I frankly confessed to a feeling that it was all inconclusive. To a skeptical outsider, your prepared room and your machinery savor of commercial magic. They suggest wires, dictaphones, trick handcuffs, and all the rest of it. That these phenomena were genuine, I am inclined to grant, but as chairman of a research committee, I should like to have a sitting with Mrs. Crandon in some other place, in New York City if possible, without you or any of your friends in the circle. I am asking this in the friendliest spirit. Only in some such way can we meet the criticism of those who say nothing can happen except in a prepared room and with Dr. Crandon present. I grant that your room is a laboratory and that more and stronger phenomena can be produced here than elsewhere. But in my judgment, a few phenomena on neutral ground and under control of my committee would have far more value to the public than all the marvels produced here. He replied that the medium was not seeking endorsement, and that he was reluctant to turn her over to the control of a committee. With that, I sympathize, I responded. But I have had many such test seances with women psychics, and you may be assured of the fullest consideration for Mrs. Crandon. I shall ask Mrs. Derue, the secretary of my committee, and Mrs. Garland to be present. As I rose to go, he said... I am favorably impressed with your plan, but I must take time to discuss it with my wife and Dr. Richardson. I shall write you our decision in a few days. To Bristol and Gordon I reported the results of my visit to the Crandons. I was favorably impressed by them and shall not permit newspaper criticism to prejudice their case. I shall draw my own conclusions in this instance as I have in many others during my long experience. Chapter 21 The Voices of the Dead on May 26, 1927, I received a letter from Dr. Crandon in which he agreed to have me conduct a test seance with Mrs. Crandon anywhere in Boston, provided her physician, Dr. Richardson, and Mrs. Richardson were present. Mrs. Crandon cannot go to New York. First, because it would not mean any more than a sitting in any house not ours in Boston. And second, the mediumship is entirely amateur and not seeking endorsement. In fact, after our experience, we are inclined to believe that endorsement is a bad thing to have. Shortly after this, I received a letter from Dr. Richardson, to whom apparently the whole matter had been referred. He wrote that Mrs. Crandon was willing to sit with me in any room in or near Boston, provided Mrs. Richardson were present. In reply, I suggested bringing Mrs. Derryu, who was not only acting secretary of my committee, but was chairman of the Society's Publications Committee. In case she cannot come, I will bring Mrs. Garland. 
I grant the justice of your request that a woman should be in the circle. But to cover disputed points, we should have Mrs. Crandon sit without a cabinet and under entirely different methods of control. In this way, I concluded, we shall negative the reports of certain scientific critics and render my own official report the more valuable. I particularly wish to have your voice cut out test applied. I think it entirely admirable. In order to meet the charge of untying knots, it is my practice to employ tape in confining the psychic's wrists and to nail the tape to the chair and also to the floor. In many cases, I have used dental flosses and added precaution. Dr. Richardson promptly sent me his acceptance of my conditions. There will be no difficulty, I am sure, about your methods of control. Anything that causes no discomfort to the psychic will be acceptable. The place of meeting you can yourself select anywhere in Greater Boston. As regards the time, about 9 p.m. has become almost the official time for Walter's appearance and he goes away quite promptly at half past 10. As regards the cabinet, we generally use at such sittings a three-way screen. This can easily be secured. As regards the phenomena to be tested, we expect to try at first only those which have become thoroughly familiar to Walter. In this connection, it might be desirable to get some of Walter's fingerprints in a locality removed at some distance from Lime Street. In such a case, would you mind having present Captain Fife, the fingerprint expert from the United States Navy who has this entire matter in charge? To this I replied, I shall be very willing to have Captain Fife present. If we can get fingerprints of all of us, including the fingerprints of Walter, we will gain something very much worthwhile, and I shall report on them in detail. The three-way screen will be entirely acceptable to me. A system of control such as I have suggested would do away with all talk of trick screw eyes, slip anklets, and the like. Mrs. Crandon can be assured that I will ask for nothing which may prove painful to her. We should, of course, have a stenographer. I realize that we must not try too many things, but it might not be a bad policy to be prepared with the balances and the voice cutout machine. I should like to make it as conclusive as a single sitting can be. I am unable, however, to name a room in which we could meet. Most of my Boston friends, I regret to say, are in opposition, and it would not be well to have the sitting in the home of any of the known partisans of the psychic. Mrs. Derrieu is disposed to think that a room in a hotel would solve our difficulty, but this is distasteful to me. As a compromise, Dr. Richardson then suggested that Mrs. Derrieu and I come to dinner at his house and use his dining room for the seance. As he lived in Newton Center, several miles from Lime Street, and as Dr. Crandon was not even to enter the house, I saw no reason for declining this arrangement. An entirely neutral roof would have been preferable, but none such offered. The house I found to be a plain suburban cottage, entirely free of any spiritualistic suggestion. It was indeed pleasingly commonplace, and Dr. and Mrs. Richardson were cordial and attractive hosts. Mrs. Derrieu and I were the only guests, and we discussed quite frankly the character of the Crandons and the mediumship with which Dr. Richardson had been associated from the first. I approve of your plan to test the psychic in extemporized conditions and in the absence of her husband, he said. The doctor will drive Marjorie out at eight, but we will see that he does not put a foot inside the door. As soon as dinner was over, I set about transforming the room into a laboratory. The long table having been cleared, I shoved it against the kitchen door and then helped Mrs. Richardson to darken the windows whilst Dr. Richardson brought in the voice cutout machine and the material for the thumbprint experiments. A three-wing screen was set up as a cabinet. Over this I threw a robe, and in it I placed a chair with wooden arms. I want to drive nails into those arms, I explained to Captain Fife, who came in at this time. Fife was introduced to me as a fingerprint expert connected with the naval station. At 8.30, Marjorie came. Mrs. Derrieu and Mrs. Richardson met her and took her into an upper chamber where they disrobed and examined her. When she entered the seance room, she wore a loose sleeve robe. But under my direction, Mrs. Richardson drew these sleeves tight about Marjorie's wrists and stitched around them a fold of the long tape which I had provided for that purpose. I then nailed the folded sleeves and the double tape to the arms of the chair as I had so often done with Mrs. Smiley. The reader will see that all talk of hidden wires and machinery, all question of trick knots, all remarks about prearranged devices of any kind must be ruled out of this sitting. With the aid of Mrs. Derrieu, loops of tape were next passed around the psychic's ankles, and after joining the two ends of this tape with the ends of those which confined the psychic's hands, I nailed them securely to the floor behind the screen. The simplicity of this control is its recommendation, I said to Fife. If there is any virtue in tapes and tacks, the psychic will be found here after the sitting exactly as she is now. The heat of the room was intense, and the psychic's position sadly uncomfortable, but she submitted cheerfully to our bonds. She made no objection to having a ribbon tied close about her neck and nodded to the high back of her chair. We must be able to say that you could not stoop and could not lift your wrists from your chair, I said, and in the spirit of a martyr she granted the need of all these precautions. 
Fife had brought with him several sheets of paper especially prepared to receive fingerprints and also several cakes of wax to be used for thumbprints. After taking impressions of all our thumbs, he asked that a kettle of hot water, a cloth, and a long flat dish be in readiness. The door into the kitchen was barred by the heavy dining table, and the door into the lighted hall was closed. The girl who served as stenographer was placed in a small china closet at the corner of the seance room. This closet had no outside door. A red light and a small table enabled the girl to make a stenographic record of proceedings. Fife took a seat at the psychic's right hand whilst I controlled her left hand. And when I say I controlled, I mean just that. I held it so closely that it could not and it did not participate in any of the phenomena which followed. Fife's control of her right hand was equally unrelenting, according to his report. Furthermore, Crandon, the arch-conspirator, according to several highly critical reports by university men, must be counted out. He did not enter the house and had no part in the proceedings. Dr. Richardson, who sat directly opposite the psychic and has at the farthest point from her, was in charge of the lamp which had been fitted with a soft red bulb. Mrs. Dario, my assistant, controlled Fife's right hand while his left hand was clasping the psychic's right wrist. Almost immediately after the light went out, I heard a loud merry whistle, like that of a boy signaling to his fellows, and a moment later a curious guttural voice was heard that might have come from deep in a man's throat. It had nothing feminine in it. From where I sat, this voice appeared to come from the corner of the closet beyond the improvised cabinet in which the psychic sat. It could have been caused by the stenographer or by Fife, but I could not refer it to the lips of the psychic. Dr. and Mrs. Richardson declared it to be the voice of the psychic's brother, Walter, and they greeted him cordially. Good evening, Walter. As he answered in slangy, humorous phrases, his voice cleared. He addressed me in a rather more serious tone, promising to meet my requirements. All of this, I will admit, might have come from Fife or the psychic, although I did not think so then or at any other stage of the proceedings. Walter now took entire charge of the experimentation. He was direct, positive, not to say impudent at times. He did not regard it as a religious ceremony. It was a laboratory experiment. His utterances became fluent. At the floor of my right, a basket containing ten or fifteen wooden letters had been placed. I was careful not to handle these letters or even look at them and when Walter ordered me to place the basket in front of the psychic's feet, I readily complied, for I knew that the psychic could not pick them up with her slippered foot. Is your control perfect, Captain Fife? I asked. It is, he replied. The others also declared control complete. With my right hand gripping the psychic's left wrist and Fife professedly controlling her right, I waited for Walter to demonstrate his freedom of action. I heard a fumbling in the basket. Something fell upon the floor. Walter said, that is a Z. I picked the letter up and held it to the red lights. That is right, it is a Z. One by one, five or six letters were tossed from the basket toward me, and correctly named in every case but one. Walter was mistaken in calling an M a W, a natural mistake even for a spook. So far as the psychic's left hand was concerned, she had nothing to do with these simple but momentous happenings. Granting that she could not have uttered the words ascribed to Walter, I am certain that she could not pick those letters from the basket with her toes much less could she identify them. She could not stoop in any degree, for her head was bound to the back of her chair. She could not move her hands one inch from the arms of the chair, for they were circled with tape and nailed to the wooden arms, and in addition, they were held by Captain Fife and myself. This perception of small objects in black darkness, the reader will recall, had many times aroused my wonder and led to experiment, and I regarded this as just another supernormal stunt with which the psychic had nothing to do in any normal way. Richardson could not have reached the basket even with his foot, and Fife would have had to do both the handling of the letters and the ventriloquism necessary to perform the trick. Furthermore, he could not reach the basket with his right hand. I could have picked up the basket, but I could not have produced the voice and I could not have differentiated the letters. Whoever did the trick, it was not Marjorie. In my previous seances, I had many times seen ectoplasmic hands and felt the grip of ectoplasmic fingers but I'd never witnessed the production of an ectoplasmic thumbprint. Fife and Walter had both promised it, and as all our thumbprints had been taken at the beginning of the sitting, any impressions made during the hour must either accuse or exonerate us all. On the table is a packet of white paper specially treated for the reception of fingerprints, and on this, Walter now promised to lay his hands. I'll give you a print of all the fingers on both my hands, he said. Turn the paper over, Fife. Fife arose and reshaped the pile of sheets on the table and returned to his seat. We then heard a rustling of the papers, and Walter called out in a tone of jocular challenge, You'll find I've placed both my hands on the two top sheets of the pile. 
At this point, Richardson lit the red lamp, and Fife removed the top sheets and put them on one side. I pause here to say that at the close of the sitting, Fife developed these prints with powder charcoal while I looked on. I saw the prints develop. They were of two large, strong hands, a man's hands, both right and left, with fingers widely spread. They were absolutely not those of the psychic. Fife said they are Walters, and I let it go with that. I had no way of proving that they were not. Let the reader reflect with me for a moment on this unexpected demonstration of Walter's power. He had shown not only that the spread hands were masculine, but that they were left and right hands laid on the paper at the same time. They had not the precise value of proving any identity, but they cleared the psychic of any normal complicity in their production. Walter was a busy sprite. Something was doing every moment of time. He seemed to be in several places at once, but his voice came from a point apparently beyond the psychic. He never seemed to be at my shoulder or at my side, but he operated at my knee and on the floor at my right utterly out of Fife's reach. He wished us to understand that the prints of his hands were in no sense a substitute for thumbprints, and he now called on Fife and Richardson to cooperate with him in the attempt to get an impression of his thumb on the tablet of wax which had been given to me at the beginning of the sitting and which I had marked for identification. Richardson now placed on the table a shallow dish filled with hot water and in this Fife laid a strip of cloth in my tablet of wax. Walter will take this wax out if it is soft enough, and he will press his thumb upon it, Richardson declared. Immediately after the light was dimmed, Walter set to work. We could hear him as he busied himself. He exclaimed boyishly, gee, that water's hot. And a moment later he added, it's too hot. His voice was now quite clear. When the red light was turned on, the cloth was outside the dish with the wax tablet partly mashed and rolled lying upon it. Two hands must have been used in this act. Here again, the critical reader can accuse Dr. Richardson or Fife, but he cannot accuse the psychic. She had nothing to do with the handling of that wax or with lifting the hot, wet cloth. The resulting print was imperfect, but Fife said it was made by Walter. I saw the print, but I was not qualified to say whether it was a right or left thumb. Fife was disappointed, but I was not. I was not concerned with proving Walter's identity. I was testing the medium's power. In foregoing chapters, the reader will recall my attempts to verify the spirit voices by covering the mouth of Mrs. Smiley with a cloth, and later with my hand. At my request, Richardson now brought his voice cutout machine into action. When the psychic blows into the tube, the two pithballs take different levels, said Fife, and so remain as long as the psychic continues to blow. It was an ingenious and apparently infallible test. Marjorie could not speak while she blew into it. I had never before been able to wholly satisfy myself that the independent voice was independent from the medium, but now, according to Fife and Richardson, I was about to have it proven. The red light was now on, and I could see the psychic quite plainly. She was leaning back in her chair, limp and still half asleep. Taking position beside her, I placed the mouthpiece in her lips with my own hands while Mrs. Darieu, my assistant, rose and held her palm above the open end of the taller tube to prevent any outside interference. As the psychic blew into the mouthpiece and the two pithballs took unstable equilibrium, Walter, as if to double the value of her test, uttered a clear and powerful whistle. He then sang, and his voice rang out more powerfully and with clearer utterance than at any other moment of the seance. Some may say that the stenographer was the whistler and Fife the singer. I cannot say that he was not, but I affirm that Marjorie's lips had nothing to do with the production of these sounds. Furthermore, the Walter voice heard while Marjorie's mouth was stopped was that of a vigorous, humorous, rough-and-ready man of twenty-five or thirty, with such intonation as a Canadian youth working as a conductor on a streetcar would use. He had not much respect for me or for the other sitters except as our actions bore upon the character of the psychic. He called me Garland in a friendly tone and spoke to me as if I were a man of his own age and walk of life. Death had not increased his reverence for age. He was shrewd, unrefined, resourceful, and combative. His dominant motive was to prove that the psychic had no hand or voice in the proceedings. The net results of this sitting can be concisely stated. 1. Crandon, the arch-conspirator of the academic committee, was entirely eliminated. He was ten miles away and had absolutely nothing to do with what took place. 2. Marjorie had nothing to do normally with the production of the handprint or thumbprint phenomena. Her hands were rigidly controlled by Fife and myself while Walter was tossing out the letters and also when working among the dishes. Her organs of speech were under mechanical control while Walter sang. 3. The prints of two large hands, not those of any member of the circle, were left upon a sheet of paper. I affirm that so far as her left hand is concerned, she had no normal part in that print, and the right hand print was of corresponding size. 4. Small objects were moved without possible contact by the psychic. 5. Small objects were handled and identified in the dark. 
actions entirely outside the normal activity of the psychic. This telekinetic handling of small objects and their supernormal perception I had many times witnessed. But the prints of hands on sheets of paper, the thumbprints on the wax, and the elimination of the psychic speech organs from any share in the production of the voice were all new and of deep significance. I put the mouthpiece between the psychic's lips, and I watched her closely as she blew into it while Walter whistled. Finally, I asked the reader to note that the sitting had none of the customary spiritualistic coloring. It had no ritual, and none of my dead relatives or friends spoke to me. The only invisible in attendance was Walter, and he brought no message. None of us regarded the hour as one of consolation and reunion, and neither did Walter. He was in effect an inventor, providing new evidences of spirit power. In demonstrating his supernormal ability to see and feel, he was definitely exonerating his sister from all charges of deceit. In truth, he completely ignored her at times. It was all highly dramatic, an amazing exhibition of a highly developed ectoplasmic organism. While he could not be seen, he was to my other senses as much a personality as the Katie King of Sir William Crooks. He presented himself as a youth, humorous, powerful, impudent, and testy. He ordered us about like children. He assumed the tone of a master as though by the mere act of dying he had become possessed of all the wisdom of Lodge and Edison, and yet he busied himself with tricks to astonish us like a boy of twelve. To accuse me or Captain Fife of fraud has no value except that by doing so the charge of deceit is shifted from the psychic. Some of the feats Fife could have done, but others were impossible to him or to me. I could have carried out some of the phenomena, but neither of us could have produced all of them. I leave the doubter to draw his own conclusions from this plain tale. It was a hot, uncomfortable confinement, but Mrs. Crandon met every demand cheerfully and without the slightest complaint. In scores of sittings hitherto, I had seen ectoplasmic hands. I had felt them. I had seen them right. Now here I had their imprint. To whom did they belong? The lines of these thumbprints would ultimately tell us. They were precise mechanical records, not vague memories which may be only mind readings. Only one objection remained. The scene of the sitting was not neutral ground. I determined to ask for this as a further step in advance. You've been listening to Classic Paranormal's reading of 40 Years of Psychic Research by Hamlin Garland. This was the seventh episode. Be sure to click into the succeeding episodes until the book is complete. Until then, followers of the freaky, aficionados of the afterworldly, connoisseurs of the creepy, stay spooky. Before you go, consider subscribing to my new podcast, Classic Paranormal. It's a clearinghouse for lost real-life accounts of true ghost stories. It's found on Apple Podcasts. Go there now if you're interested in enigmatic tales, chilling true accounts, chronicles from cases of the past that time has forgotten, but that the modern person who likes relaxing by a campfire swapping ghost stories might appreciate. As I said, the new podcast I'm launching is available on Apple Podcasts and Spotify, and there's a link in the description below on this video.